Hello everyone, welcome to UCL's lunch hour lecture. Uh, today the lecture will be on is climate change increasing disasters. My name is Dr Gina Tronley. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University and I'm an honorary research fellow here at University College London in the Institute for Global Health. I will be chairing today's lecture. It is my honour and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ilan Kelman. Alan Kelman is a professor of disasters and health at University College London and a professor too at the University of Agar in Norway. His overall research interest is linking disasters and health, integrating climate change into both. Uh, before we begin, I want to let you know that we will have some time at the end to answer um, questions. And if you have any questions at any point during Alan's talk, you can do so via the Slido, so sli.do. You can enter that into your internet browser, and then there is a code that you need to enter, which is hash disasters with an S on the end. Uh, and we'll now hand over to Alan for his talk. Thank you so much, and such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity, particularly to discuss this question, how does climate change affect disasters, including conflicts? And first, the baseline. There is no doubt that we are changing the climate, rapidly and substantively. The implications are huge. There are nuances and unknowns, especially regarding disasters. I present here some thoughts recognizing that the science evolves rapidly. What I say cannot necessarily be taken as definitive or constant. Instead, it indicates directions of inquiry to be examined, to be critiqued and better understood. And that's where we need you. We need you to join us in the science, in the discussions, to ensure that what we are doing is correct and does help people deal not just with climate change, but with all disasters. In this talk, as you might have seen, I do not use a lot of slides, so you will not always see slides. And when I share my screen, I'll just keep it in PowerPoint rather than going to the full screen in order to help go back and forth and hopefully be a bit more engaging with the audience. This is particularly important, especially when starting with the basics. And the basics, the baseline, understanding what climate change is. In fact, by definition, climate change is weather statistics changing over decades, that is, long-term changes to the weather. And climate change has happened since the Earth formed. These natural influences continue. Today's concern is how rapidly and substantively our activity, human activity, is changing the climate. We are releasing greenhouse gases and destroying ecosystems that remove these gases. The increased greenhouse gases trap more heat from the sun, warm the planet, and that changes the weather. And there's no doubt about this. We just cannot dispute it. We are changing the climate rapidly and substantively, which impacts weather we are seeing now. But that's weather. What are the implications for disasters, including conflict? Well, let's take an example. And I'm going to start with a certain category of storms. They are called tropical cyclones, tropical cyclones. We often call them hurricanes or typhoons or cyclones. That actual name depends where they form in the world. And one area, which gets hit by cyclones is Bangladesh. Bangladesh has had devastating disasters involving cyclones. 1970, possibly 300,000, possibly 500,000 killed. 1985, tens of thousands of people killed. 1991, generally accepted that 138,000 people or maybe 143,000 people, I mean, it's scary how different those death tolls are, were killed in 1991. But yet the past three or four years, Bangladesh has been hit by several terrible cyclones. The death toll is in the dozens. Dozens is not good. It's still people dead. It's still families and lives devastated. But dozens is a lot better than tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. So why? Why did Bangladesh manage this even as the climate is changing? Because they've spent generation, they've spent a generation educating people about cyclones, implementing warning, evacuation, and sheltering, so people know what to do, they have confidence that they know what they're doing, and lives are saved. On the opposite side of the world, Toronto. Toronto, Canada, 1954. Hurricane Hazel slashed through the city. 
Houses were swept away in the ensuing floods. Across Ontario, about 84 people were killed. In that aftermath, Toronto said, never again. And in the context of wider municipal and government changes, Toronto decided not to rebuild houses in the floodplain. Toronto decided that they would turn the river systems into ravines for recreation and for the environment. They let the floodplains be floodplains. And Toronto has been hit by hurricanes since 1954, such as Hurricane Sandy in 2012. The floodplains flooded, the rivers were raging torrents, trees went down, the mud slicked across the pathways, but there was no disaster. So these successes certainly do not stop all disasters in Bangladesh and Toronto, not even all flooding in Bangladesh and Toronto, but it shows that some disasters can be avoided and they are absolutely examples to follow and to improve. We can act to avoid disasters, irrespective of the weather. And the same applies to other phenomena, including earthquakes and tsunamis. So we try to avoid the phrase natural disaster. They are just disasters. And disasters are not from nature, so they are not natural. Disasters are determined by how society deals or cannot deal with the environment, a storm or an earthquake, including how people are or are not supported for dealing with any weather. Probably everyone on this call has access to real-time weather forecasts and warnings. Probably everyone can choose their own raincoat or their own umbrella. Not everyone can afford to access such weather-related information. Not everyone can afford to purchase the accessories that prove the point that there is no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. We are poor, so we are forced to live on marginalized land in the floodplain. Money went to the military rather than to roads, so there's no bridge across the river for the kids to get to school. Kickbacks to developers let houses be built in the floodplain. No interest in supporting those houses having flood measures. Actually, you know, my neighbors down the street, they went down to the town council and they called out corruption, publicizing it. Last night, they were shot. None of this links to human-caused climate change. None of this links to how climate change affects rainfall. Instead, people with political power, opportunities, and resources make choices to cause these problems. They force difficulties on others so that people then have difficulties and people end up having trouble because disasters could have been avoided but weren't. Then when what we see is that the others are experiencing these difficulties due to choices from those with power, opportunities, and resources, which means that it is effectively disaster by choice. And this is the key. Certain people are making choices for many others. Certain people are choosing to put others in difficult situations whereby they cannot deal with the problems, the societal problems that arise to end up in a disaster. To avoid disasters, to stop disasters, we need appropriate choices. Appropriate choices by the people with political power, opportunities, and resources. The problem in this photo that I took in Northern England is not so much that a lot of rain caused an underground river to rise, the problem is that a house was built over the river without flood risk reduction measures. It is a fundamental philosophical problem that if a flood happens in a forest when no one is around, does it make a sound? Climate change probably influenced the rainfall. Climate change did not influence the decision to build in a floodplain without considering floods. Yet we are changing the climate. 
we see it everywhere. And the, we know that the weather is changing, and we know that floodplains change. Floodplains also change for other reasons. We are paving over green areas. We are expanding cities. We are engineering rivers and coastlines. Even in a changing climate, we can enact local changes to avoid people living in a floodplain, as was done in Toronto, or to let people live in a floodplain, but taking appropriate measures, as has been done in Bangladesh. Especially since not all weather is getting worse because of human-caused climate change. Uh, aside from cold weather diminishing, consider the storms that hit Toronto and Bangladesh. Those are called tropical cyclones. Human-caused climate change is affecting these storms. And as we see from the paper, the numbers of those storms are decreasing. The expectation is fewer hurricanes and fewer cyclones and fewer typhoons because of human-caused climate change. But when one of these storms forms, it will be stronger. The storms also appear to be slowing down, so they drop more rain in one place. And their tracks might be changing, although there's a lot of discussion regarding that. Do fewer tropical cyclones and do more intense tropical cyclones matter for disasters? Well, if someone has an adequate home, then it will stand up, it will help them in any way, rain, wind or any rain or any flood. If not, then yeah, <laughs> there can be a disaster. In 2017, the Caribbean island of Dominica was devastated by Hurricane Maria. Claims were made that this disaster came from climate change. In 1979, Dominique was devastated by Hurricane David. Many of the disaster's proportional impacts were similar in 1979 and 2017. Human-caused climate change most likely made Hurricane Maria stronger than it would have been otherwise. Hurricane David was still amazingly strong. Why did Dominica not prepare for hurricanes after 1979? When we are in Hurricane Alley, and it is hurricane season, we should expect a hurricane. A hurricane as strong as Hurricane Marina, uh, as Hurricane Maria, and as Hurricane David, or even stronger than both of those, was a known possibility for Dominica long before 1979. There were decades to be ready for it. Climate change does not dictate our choices to prepare for known weather or not. When weather is known and not prepared for, then the weather does not cause a disaster. This is exactly why, as with Toronto and Bangladesh, but not with Dominica, weather and climate change are poorly correlated with disasters. With exceptions. One huge terrifying exception is that the higher heat and humidity from human-caused climate change is impacting us now. Heat-humidity combinations requiring indoor temperature control to survive are appearing more frequently and they are lasting longer. Human-caused climate change is pushing us into hot, humid weather that modern humanity has never before experienced to this extent, and it is basically not survivable for us outdoors, especially when it does not cool down at night and when this weather lasts for several days. Not everyone can afford indoor cooling. Not everyone can afford to stay indoors for a long time. We tried that with lockdowns during the COVID-19 pandemic. There were implications. Many people must work outdoors, agricultural, construction, and delivery workers. Heat waves are already big disasters and will become much worse, directly linked to climate change, with little scope to alleviate all the suffering. From India and Pakistan to London and Paris to British Columbia and Washington State, scientists are now estimating how many heat-related deaths can be attributed to human-caused climate change. Given what has happened already, does not look good for the future. 
in this case, climate change is increasing disasters. Then further effects emerge, one of which is vegetation fires, often called forest fires, grassland fires, wildfires, wildland fires. These fires are essential for the ecosystems. Without regular fires, many of the plant species would not survive and the ecosystem would be undermined. Then we build into burnable areas and are understandably horrified that our infrastructure burns, that a fire disaster happens. In July 2021, the town of Lytton, British Columbia, Canada burned, killing at least two people. It was attributed to climate change. The town had burned before, including in 1931 and 1949. Anywhere, long histories of disasters typically exist. The modern era has put more people and property and livelihoods into harm's way. So disasters can be much worse through these choices, disaster by choice. Nor is it ever that simple. As fire shows, human-caused climate change is affecting wind and drought. Wind and drought affect fire. Vegetation fires are changing away from the characteristics with which many of the ecosystems evolved. And many ecosystems, including in the Arctic, are burning in very different ways than they have over the past 10,000 years or so. So the fires are typically becoming more intense, and they're sometimes, for example, burning more of a tree than would typically burn. Not all fires are natural, and not all fires help the ecosystems. But in addition to human-caused climate change, we are changing fires in other ways, such as how and when they start. The main natural ignition sources are lightning and volcanic eruptions. Human-caused climate change is affecting lightning frequency, although we are not certain on exact trends and there may be highly localized, either increasing or decreasing lightning frequency. But human beings, us, have brought different ignition sources. Arson, campfires, cigarettes, vehicles backfiring. When we change the ignition patterns, especially frequency, we change fire patterns, especially frequency. At the same time, we've spent decades and centuries managing forests and grasslands, often creating forests and grasslands, changing the species, and quite often suppressing small fires that ecosystems want. So yeah, human-caused climate change is changing fire characteristics. We are changing fire characteristics in many other ways, which also then affects the smoke characteristics. Some fire characteristics come from smoke, leading to breathing difficulties a long way from the fire's front. Human-caused climate change, we might soon be able to connect that to deaths and breathing difficulties from wildfire smoke. Other difficulties merge. Human-caused climate change is affecting beetles and fungus that harm fire-prone trees. The interaction among beetles and fungus and drought and wind and previous fires and soil conditions appears to be making it harder for some forests to recover after a fire. But then without the trees, the beetles do not survive, which might let the forest grow back, but grow back into a changing climate, which favors the beetles and the fungus. All these interactions, all these interplays, determining the exact cause and influences of a wildfire's specific characteristics and the ecosystem responses is not easy. What else is not amenable to strict linear or straightforward connections. Another type of disaster, conflict. Populist phrases, climate conflict, climate wars. Yet we don't wake up in the morning, look at the thermometer and say, oh, it's 34 degrees outside today. Yesterday it was 33 degrees. So you know what? I'm going to start a war. Of course that doesn't happen. And after all, Putin launched the full-scale invasion of Ukraine last year in winter remembering that a sample size of one is not statistically significant. For conflict and peace, 
factors other than the environment and environmental changes are inevitably involved. These factors come from people. Human choices through political power, not the climate and not how the climate is changing. The media love the example of Syria. They create this linear, perfectly stepwise process whereby human caused climate change led to a major drought. A major drought led to major migration. Major migration led to a major war. Syria did experience a major drought in the years before 2011, which is when around when the war began. There was definitely a much higher likelihood of these drought conditions due to human-caused climate change. Over the previous century, Syria had droughts which were as bad or even worse than during the pre-2011 period. Meanwhile, over previous decades, Syria had been led by oppressive dictators who mismanaged the country's water and agriculture, supporting drought. The country was ripe for a conflict irrespective of climate change. Even without climate change, a major drought would have happened at some point. Even without a major drought, a major conflict would have happened at some point. Linking conflict to weather or to changes in the weather, including through climate change, is tenuous. It is the same with linking peace to weather and changes in the weather. So I've studied a lot a field called disaster diplomacy. Disaster diplomacy investigates how and why disaster-related activities do and do not influence conflict and cooperation. We, we've examined dozens of case studies around the world and across history. All evidence so far shows that disaster-related activities do not, do not create fresh diplomatic or peace opportunities, but they have the possibility for catalyzing and supporting diplomatic action, which is already ongoing, although this possibility is not always fulfilled. This conclusion applies to all disaster-related activities, including disaster risk reduction, emergency management and reconstruction. Basically, disaster-related activities and saving lives are not necessarily a high political priority. I hope this didn't shock anyone. There are other examples we have in disaster diplomacy that nuance this conclusion and do not make it so simple. In particular, plenty happens away from the public eye through personal connections, and through different informal processes. As we continue this research, we might be seeing examples in which disaster diplomacy succeeds more. We might also be seeing examples where dealing with disasters exacerbates or supports or leads to conflict and, and we get back to heat. There are possible links between increased heat and violent behavior. Our bodies respond biochemically to heat and humidity, leading to stress that can compound physically and affect us mentally. Some mental health and well being conditions, as well as medications for them, are affected by increased temperatures and by humidity. So, our bodies change, how we deal with our bodies change, and it may lead to some aspects of violent behavior. Does this mean? that we should blame violence on heat and humidity from climate change? Would a court acquit a defendant who said, yes, they did assault that person in hot weather, but it was because of climate change? We need inputs from crime scientists, judges, and lawyers. This is not just about climate change. So many factors, so many topics, expertises, and interactions making definitive statements challenging. It calls into question direct attribution of climate change to conflict and peace, and it calls into question statements that there are no links. Consider, too, known consequences of disasters, including conflict, which, as we've seen with Syria, sadly, includes forced migration, such as refugees. Within forced migration, a legal definition of refugee exists. Refugees are people not returning to their country of nationality, 
due to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. The number of climate change refugees or climate refugees is unambiguously zero by definition because of the definition of refugee. For now, it cannot include climate or environmental reasons. The response, well, take this convention and protocol, take this definition and change it. Well, that's fine, but I can guarantee you what will happen. Some countries will say, oh, you know what? Climate change is really important and we have to account for refugees from climate change. But you know, that definition is interesting because membership of a particular social group is a bit vague. Why don't we remove that? And you know what? I'm not fully convinced about religion because we have some very violent religions within our country. So maybe we should remove that to help stop the religious violence. We open up that convention and protocol we cause major problems. This objection is not theoretical. Last month, a senior UK minister stated that this system is outdated and should be reformed to let fewer people qualify. Irrespective, not all forced migrants are refugees. Uh, we know climate refugees do not exist. We know climate change refugees do not exist. What about climate change migrants? Climate change forced migrants? So I looked for and could not find many examples. There are a few out there, but they are small. Now that, that's certainly concerning because people being forced out of their homes is not good. It was also concerning how many examples of forced migration were assumed to be climate change without providing evidence that they are climate change. So in response, I wrote this paper, which really went through many of the examples, examining the claims and the numbers, and showed that most of them, although not all of them, there are examples, but most of them were in effect imaginary, emerging from political choices of definitions and of attribution. More examples could appear in the future. We are continuing to watch it. And again, we're back to heat and humidity. Large areas of our planet will become too hot to live. The choice will be to leave or to die. Heat humidity is an exception to this rule of imaginary numbers. It is a huge and scary exception and does have the possibility for large numbers, non-imaginary numbers, of climate change force migrants. And there are other possibilities which we're continuing to monitor, we're continuing to look at. Sea level rise, acidifying oceans, while always recognizing that no one forced to move because of a storm or because of lack of rain or because of much other weather, no one would necessarily be a climate change migrant because storms and rain and lack of rain are weather, while few disasters arise from such weather. So how do we summarize disasters, including conflict, implications, including forced migration? Overall, the importance of climate change, human-caused climate change for this context, relates mainly to heat and humidity at the moment. As has been the theme throughout, there's so much science to do. It is evolving. And we must be wary of links that are missing, uncertain, unknown, and nonlinear. We do need you to join us in adding to our understanding and ensuring that this understanding serves society, that science serves society. Our investigations continue about climate change and disaster connections. For instance, large scale ocean current changes, permafrost melting, and many more. We cannot always give clear or final answers nor should we, because of course, environment is always changing and society is always changing. As with any relationship, it's complicated. Consequently, we should not, we cannot suddenly blame long-standing, deep-seated, fundamental disaster-causing problems on a single topic, such as human-caused climate change. 
we are changing the climate significantly. We see the impacts now. We know what to do to stop it. We are not permitted to bypass science, such as by assuming that human-caused climate change creates or worsens all disaster problems and all societal problems. Th that would be climate change determinism, blaming climate change for everything. The real climate disaster, the real climate crisis might be linking or trying to link everything to climate change causes. The real climate conflict might be the conflict between rhetoric and reality. The reality remains, we should not be changing the climate. Because of heat humidity, because of all the knock-on effects, because of all the other major problems, and because of all the unknowns, and because it's cheaper to change for the better than to change the climate, right? Who cares about lives? It's all about money. Getting rid of fossil fuels will save us so much money. Fossil fuels contribute immensely to air pollution. Think of the cost of that in terms of lives, in terms of health. There's fossil fuel subsidies. Our tax money is going to subsidizing fossil fuel companies for on average over 400 billion euros a year directly. 400 billion euros per year. When we count for indirect costs, such as health and environment, including air pollution, some calculations put it at over 6 trillion euros per year that we are subsidizing fossil fuels. Stop fossil fuels, we save that money. And fossil fuels are finite anyway. They must run out, so we're going to have to change. We might not want to change, but we have to. So these three reasons do not mention climate change. We need to solve the fossil fuel problem because of pollution, subsidies, and they will run out the immense monetary, financial, economic costs from fossil fuels. Ultimately, fundamentally, we must tackle overconsumption while ethically stabilizing the human population. So that's easy. I mean, no problem at all, right? If we do so, by definition, we will stop human-caused climate change without even mentioning climate change. So why start with climate change? Remember climate change's role. All it does is change the environment like so many other influences. If we avoided disasters, then by definition, we would address human-caused climate change's consequences, even if we did not intend to. Because as per the circles, climate change sits within these wider contexts. Even wider, beyond disasters. If we achieved a truly healthy, safe, and sustainable society, then by definition we would avoid disasters and we would stop human-caused climate change and its adverse consequences, whether or not we intend to. In a sense, we can address human-caused climate change by not mentioning human-caused climate change. Conversely, if we put climate change first, and if we focus on human-caused climate change, then we have no guaranteeing of addressing all the other horrible challenges that we face and have created, from slavery to deforestation, from sexism to ideological support for genocide. Imagine. We get together and we build the perfect school for climate change. It's energy efficient. It's off grid producing its own power. And, and it's out of the floodplain, which is expected to expand because of climate change. We're only in part of that smallest circle. Has that school really helped if it collapses in the next earthquake? killing the staff and students? Well, okay, that's fine. So let's deal with the smaller circle, climate change, earthquakes, all other else will go one circle wide and make it perfectly for avoiding disasters. So the school is energy efficient. It's out of a floodplain. It deals with earthquakes and tsunamis and landslides and cold weather and hot weather and everything. But it's built in a place where girls are not permitted to attend school we have missed the entire outer oval. We need to connect topics, not isolate, 
not separate, not highlight human caused climate change. Although, might that be counterproductive? Climate change is populism gains attention and prominence. It brings in donations and funding. It inspires people and does lead to, well, some action and hopefully positive action. Consequently, no matter what the science suggests, climate change becomes significant for, for disasters, including conflict and forced migration, because we are subservient to the political direction. We often obey what we are told to do for what I mentioned earlier, right? Money, it's like, who cares about lives? Apparently it's all about money. And this puts climate change at the top of so many agendas. The political winds have changed due to human caused climate change as much as the winds in the air. I look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk, Alan. That was excellent. Uh, and thank you very much to our audience for submitting uh, their questions. Uh, we have a few and I'll start with uh, the ones that have been upvoted the most. Um, so there's a few with one vote. So I'll go for the top one, which is there is so much doom and gloom on these topics. How do we move away from that? Yeah, absolutely. This is a challenge. So when we look at climate change and mental health, understandably there are concerns. And the phrases which are thrown out are eco-anxiety, climate grief, doomerism. This is leading to extensive mental health problems and extensive despondency. But as sort of we've seen, we recognize that not all of the doom and gloom is scientifically supportable. So there is a lot of positive news there's a lot that we could and should be doing even in, in the context of human-caused climate change. So number one, let's be realistic. We can move away from the doom and gloom by accepting the science, recognizing the challenges, but recognizing that not everything is bad and there's so much that we can do. And number two is, look, let's be realistic. There are reasons to be unhappy, particularly with heat and humidity and possibly other impacts. But how are we going to change the situation? How are we going to act differently? And that's where we can change ourselves. We can advocate for political change. We can identify the problems. We can take different pathways, such as not even mentioning human-caused climate change, but solving the problem. And that's where climate hope comes in. That's where eco-inspiration comes in. That's where we can take charge of what we want for society, of what we want for the future, bring realistic hope, you know, not what people call an overabundance of hopium, that element that pushes into, into realms that are not realistic, but realistic hope via realistic action in order to ensure that we're tackling the baselines, we're admitting the baselines such as fossil fuel subsidies, and we are all working together to move forward in an evidence-based, action-focused approach that moves away from doom and gloom, that accepts science, and that will create the world in the future, which I hope we are all striving for. Thank you very much, Alana. Thank you very much for that question. Um, so the next one is, are tsunamis and earthquakes considered climate disasters? So almost nothing is considered a climate disaster. Earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions even less so. Fundamentally, earthquakes come from what's called tectonic forces. <clears throat> so the entire globe is made up of huge plates within the Earth's crust, which are called tect tectonic plates. Those are moving typically millimeters or centimeters per year. And as they move, there's different types of earthquakes, such as one plate sliding past another, one earthquake going underneath another, uh, that sometimes leads to volcanoes. And then when we get tsunamis from that, it's coming from, say, an underwater volcanic eruption or from an underwater earthquake. Other possibilities for tsunamis are some sort of slide, like a landslide, coming off the land into the water or an underwater landslide. 
and also when an outer space object like a meteorite or a comet hits the ocean or lake or river, hits the water and causes a tsunami. The links between climate change and those phenomena vary. Number one, what we're finding, for example, in the Arctic is some of the steep slopes of Greenland were frozen. They are now melting, which can release rock falls, landslides, uh, and snow and ice, which hits the water and causes a tsunami. That happened a few years ago in Greenland. It killed a few people and flooded several villages. The tsunami, they say, may have been between 40 to 100 meters high. Climate change was likely an influence due to that thawing, although not completely, because there have been previous tsunamis which were similar. And so there are that possible link to human-caused climate change. Outer space objects, there's absolutely no link. When we look at tsunami heights, as a sea is rising, and we're looking at millimeters to centimeters per year, that adds to the tsunami height. 10 centimeters onto 40 meters may not be that much. 10 centimeters onto two meters may have an impact. One of the current exciting areas of, of scientific investigation is actually where I started from the beginning, tectonic plates. Volcanic activity and earthquakes. There are some links between climate change, or there are theorized links between climate change and earthquakes and volcanoes. One example is as the sea level rises and as more ice and snow melts, that actually puts more weight on the Earth's crust, which can potentially lead to tectonic activity. Conversely, for an underwater volcano to erupt, the eruptive force must overcome the downward pressure of the ocean. So if we're adding water, then that mass of ocean over the volcano is more, and there has to be more upward pressure, which could potentially, again, it's theorized, could potentially lead to fewer underwater volcanoes, and then fewer tsunamis from volcanic eruptions. An example of an underwater volcanic eruption leading to tsunami was last year in January in the Pacific island country of Tonga. As the sea rises, it shifts weight around the earth. The sea ocean is moving in comparison to the land. And that shift is theorized, does change how the tectonic plates move the distribution and may lead to earthquakes. So again, this is an example of all these difficult, complicated links. And this is where we get the layering. At the first order, no, tectonic forces are not linked to climate change. But at the second order, we have all of these possibilities where there are links. And then at the third order, there's certain phenomena like a meteorite strike, which is absolutely not linked to human-caused climate change. As always, it is complicated, which makes for amazing, exciting, and much-needed science. Thank you, Alain. That was a really interesting and informative answer there. Um, so the next one um, is, how can climate adaptation agendas be better integrated across different sectors in the UK government? Yeah, I mean, that's the challenge that we're facing, particularly when climate change dominates. It's also an interesting phrase, climate adaptation. We've always had to adapt to the environment. We have always had to adjust to environmental phenomena, and that includes climate. Climate is weather statistics over decades. What we're talking about here is not climate per se, but climate change, which is those weather statistics changing. So in a sense, it's climate change adaptation. And what is different to the past is human-caused climate change adapting to that, as opposed to what we've always had to do, which is climate uh, adaptation. So one solution is let's get our terminology correct, and let's try and ensure that the UK government has its terminology correct. Second one is do we want to highlight either climate adaptation or climate change adaptation? Or do we want to unfold it with an adjustments to all of the other environmental phenomena? If, for example, we determine exactly how floods and heat humidity are being affected because of human-caused climate change, and we adapt perfectly to that through climate change adaptation, we have forgotten about floods and heat humidity 
changing because of other factors. And one major factor for floods is engineering our rivers. Another major factor for flood is paving over green areas. So do we really want climate adaptation? Do we really want climate change adaptation? Or do we want to adjust to our environment and all the ways we are influencing it and changing it? Do we want to ensure that we are never adversely affected by any weather event or other events, no matter what the cause? Do we want to integrate into UK policy and action those wider circles of sustainability, safety, and health? There is yet to be a specific climate change adaptation action or a specific climate adaptation action which is not encompassed by dealing with disasters, by disaster risk reduction. So it's an open question, why do we want to focus on climate or climate change adaptation rather than doing it all by expanding to wider adjustment in order to deal with disasters? And if I were asked in the UK policy context, I would say take the circles. I think we should be not having silos. I think we should be breaking down barriers. I think we should be ensuring sustainability, safety and health for us all across all the challenges. In the current policy environment, that's difficult because so much conflates climate adaptation, climate change adaptation, so much conflates weather with climate and climate change. So if I'm going to sit with a minister or sit with a senior civil servant, they're within this framework already using a certain vocabulary. And as scientists, we struggle with this all the time. Do we say, no, no, you're all wrong, just overturn it all and start from my basis? Or do we say, look, you're working within this, this is how we do it. And yes, of course, we do need flood plain management. We do need flood risk reduction. We do need heat humidity risk reduction within this context of climate change adaptation. I'm just really cautious of using too many words like adaptation adjustment. I'm cautious of separating like climate, climate change disasters, and instead would prefer to focus on the baseline challenges, solve it at the fundaments, and then help us all for the short term, medium term and long term future. Thank you very much for that question. That one was very popular with the audience. Um, so the next one is pastoralists who cross borders due to drought in the Horn of Africa, can they qualify for climate change force migrants slash refugees? Well, they cannot qualify as refugees because environmental changes are not within the legal definition of refugee. In terms of forced migrants, that depends so much on the context. When we look at pastoralists in Somalia and Somaliland, yes, they have been terribly affected by drought. They've also been terribly affected by conflict, by oppression, and by marginalization. We would require highly localized analyses to tease out what precipitated, what caused, what combination of factors, and combination of factors, not a single factor, actually dominated their reason to cross out of Somalia or out of Somaliland. Add on to that the fact that populations have increased for survival. Every individual must use a certain amount of water. So as population increases, water use must increase. And our overuse of water, our often mismanagement of water, frequently leads to drought as much if not more than sort of precipitation variation or snow melt variation. So how much does changing water use, how much does changing population also affect that context? Not all pastoralists in the Horn of Africa or in Somalia or Somaliland, there's many other countries there. They have different levels of oppression, marginalization, water use and conflict. And so a lot is contextual. Another example from the Horn of Africa is Ethiopia, Eritrea. There has been a absolutely horrific violent conflict there for decades. The parties have been moving around. We've had the foundation of the country of Eritrea. There's also Tigray there. Ethiopia had a, um, a sort of a, a dictator backed by many powerful countries. So how much did all of those factors impact the forced migration of pastoralists? as much as climate change impacting precipitation and thus drought. And then we have to go back farther. 
From 1968 to 1974, there was a major drought farther south from there, This what's called the Sahel of Africa. And even though it was a major drought, the analyses at that time in the 1970s and ever since highlighted the fact that it was often the arbitrary drawing of international borders which hurt the people. It was often the forced sedentarization, forcing people to settle rather than being pastoral nomads, which caused the problems. It was often undermining local traditional vernacular knowledges, which for which they dealt with drought for a long time, which caused those problems. How much of those lessons from the Sahel, 1968 to 1974, apply to the Horn of Africa today? Well, people are looking at this. Some of them do, some of them don't. The key is that they are definitely forced migrants. They are suffering, and that is not good. But attribution to climate change, not as likely as attribution to other causes, nor should we take out human-caused climate change completely because of all the interlinkages, because of all the interactions. So for dealing with the people and helping them, they are forced migrants. They need help. To investigate causation, so much is localized, and we have to go back decades in order to understand the full implications of what the people are experiencing and why they are suffering to the extent that they feel forced to cross international borders. Thank you very much for that answer, Alain. Um, so the next question, someone says that you've confused them now. Uh, they said, can we blame climate change for the negative consequences of heat waves, or should we blame our vulnerability and malmanagement of society? Yeah, it's both. If we had a perfect energy system where everything was local renewable energy, then yeah, we could give we could potentially give everyone 24-7 indoor cooling via natural ventilation and via electricity or other energy sources uh, provided sustainably locally and renewably. Do I have those numbers? No, which means it's a question. Is it actually feasible for the 8 billion people on the planet, given all the heat? And that's an open question. This means there is extensive vulnerability. There is mismanagement of society. That is absolutely an input into current heat, humidity related deaths and illnesses. The key though, is that heat humidity that we are experiencing attributed to human-caused climate change, the heat humidity that is expected to get so much worse is beyond what modern humanity has experienced. And it is linked directly to human-caused climate change. So what's called hazard, the heat humidity, what the word that the questioner used, vulnerability, our mismanagement of society, are not independent they are interlinked. So if we want to say, well, why don't we just build space stations off the world and put people there to avoid heat humidity? Yeah, that's an argument that it's actually vulnerability, not human caused climate change. But at the moment, that's not possible. We also know that people are being marginalized anyway and are not likely to be given places on that space station. So when you have been in a place for 8,000, 10,000 years, when heat humidity is directly attributable to human-caused climate change and is causing your livelihoods to be undermined, then there is a strong argument that hazard is that the heat humidity is directly causing that disaster and that that disaster is directly linked, increased by human-caused climate change. Does that sound convoluted? Yes, because it is. It's not easy. It's not straightforward. You know, people will say, well, why not just change agriculture and cropping to happen at night? People can sleep during the day, tend their crops at night. Well, think about how realistic that is. What does that mean for family life? What does that mean for culture? Yeah, there are always ways to adjust and to adapt, no matter how extreme the environment is. Unfortunately, there are also boundaries. There are realistic aspects of what people want to do and what we will do. And within those boundaries, sadly, those experiencing the extreme heat humidity are often faced with a choice to die or to leave. So it is actually not one or the other. It is both. It is a clear intersection between the environment changing because of us, heat humidity, 
the vulnerability stopping any approaches and recognizing that these are disasters which have direct links, attribution to human caused climate change, which does not remove vulnerability, does not remove the mismanagement of society. And yes, it is confusing, it is complicated, it can be convoluted, particularly when we go down to the local level and look at what is happening highly locally, irrespective of regional changes to heat and humidity. So the next question is, people use the terminology climate change migrants slash disasters because it attracts attention. How can the environmental movement better market itself? One of the challenges is the fact we do have to market ourselves and we think that marketing is appropriate, but ultimately what are we trying to achieve? My interest is science-based action, evidence-based policy, so we are serving society. In that context, these phrases are simply inappropriate and very difficult to defend. Others will indicate that that's not marketable and I'm sympathetic to that. So what are we trying to do if removing fossil fuel subsidies can be done by marketing climate change migrants? We have an ethical dilemma. Do we somewhat massage the science to get that action? Or again, do we sit there and say, look, the framing is incorrect and we need correct framing? I don't know. As a scientist, I always go for science. I want that evidence. I want to ensure we're being accurate. But i very sympathetic to those who say that may not be the most efficient, it may not be the most effective, and there may be other approaches. What I cannot be involved in, I cannot misrepresent the science, I cannot lie about our current state of knowledge, and yes, that may be ineffective marketing, that may not achieve the positive action that we're looking for, but I would say that I still have my role to play, and I really think we have to ensure that everything we do involves science as evidence-based and does not leave us open to dishonesty, disingenuity, or simply looking for an end by any means whatsoever, including dishonest means. Thank you very much for that answer, Alon. I think we probably have time for another question. Um, so uh, where do you think the discussion slash goal of, e.g., climate actions, climate emergency should be heading? I think it should be heading to uh, sort of, as I said, science-based, evidence-based and appropriate vocabulary. It's not a climate emergency. It's an overconsumption emergency. It's a human values emergency. It's not climate action because the climate exists no matter what we do, even if the statistics change significantly. It's human action. It's action for us. So where we should be heading is talk about the issues. Definitely do not overuse vocabulary. I mean, the amount of jargon is ridiculous and ensure that the phrases that we adopt are scientifically accurate and evidence-based in order to lead to human action, to overcome the human values crisis, the overconsumption emergency, and the disaster which we are creating by undermining people's lives and livelihoods over the short term and over the long term. Let's stop focusing on the words climate and climate change. Let's admit the science of them, but let's ensure that we are embracing that wider circle and the action, crisis, emergency values, behavior, and attitudes are all based on what we want for society to live sustainably, healthily, and safely on the one planet that we know we can inhabit. Thank you very much, Alon. As we only have about a minute left, uh, I'm going to close today's session. Um, it was great. It was obviously a fantastic talk. Thank you very much for giving your time. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation, a very timely presentation. Um, thank you very much to the audience and for all of your interesting questions. I'm very sorry that we didn't manage to get to all of them, but we certainly appreciate the fact that everyone was very involved in the, in the discussion there. Um, we would also like to just have a little pitch for the next lunchtime hour lecture, which will be on the 21st of November on cyber systematics, what it is and why it is why it is useful, why it is a new, sorry, pardon me, why it is a useful new way to think about complex social and environmental problems. And that will be with Dr. Stephen Harwood. 
Um, yes, thank you again to the audience. Thank you very much to Alan and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Gina.